All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jake. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, we can. All right, great. Thanks. Uh, my name is Jake. Um, I'm the communications chair uh, on the Austin DSA Leadership Committee. Uh, and I am here today to talk about uh, the Amazon unionization uh, at the Staten Island JFK 8 warehouse. Uh, very exciting news um, from the beginning of this month. Uh, which is, uh, you know, I think everyone is still processing and uh, certainly it's uh, having a ripple effect uh, across the country and, and with hundreds of other Amazon facilities reaching out to the Amazon Labor Union, ALU organizers to talk about organizing in their workplaces um, and a general uh, upsurge in interest in organizing uh, uh, workplaces across all industries, uh, as indicated by the um, vast growth in the number of uh, people who have reached out to EWOC, the Emergency Worker Organizing Committee, uh, which is a project of DSA and, uh, and UE Union. Um, so, you know, as Heather said, we touched on the Amazon one a little bit last week, but I think it's uh, something that's of vast importance and is worth going into a little more uh, in depth. Um, so the chief question that I think we have to ask uh, is, is what happened here? Why did they win? And how can we replicate this victory elsewhere? Um, and I think one uh, interesting angle uh, from which to do that is by looking a little closer at one of the source texts which the ALU organizing committee at the Staten Island Warehouse uh, studied and within their group and uh, shared with, with some of the worker leaders and organizers on the campaign. Um, and that is a, a pamphlet uh, entitled Organizing Methods in the Steel Industry, which came out in 1936, was written by William Z. Foster, who was a lifelong uh, socialist uh, leader in the Communist Party and, and, a, and, and a labor organizer. Um, and this is a short pamphlet that was written for the purpose of organizing steel workers, helping steel workers organize, um, but was meant also to uh, apply to other uh, workers and in, in, uh, in the in uh, different industries. And this pamphlet is now affixed on uh, Marxist.org with a nice uh, note that says, this document was used by New York Amazon workers in 2022 to successfully establish their right to unionize. So that's that's uh, that's pretty nice. Um, it's a very good pamphlet. Uh, I discovered it early on in the pandemic and it was uh, very inspirational to me. I think it, it speaks to uh, the spirit of uh, the unionism that that allowed um, the the Amazon labor union folks to win, um, and it's something that's worth studying uh, so that we can get at the heart of what exactly it is um, that gave them success and that was so successful in in winning over people, and not only winning the union but making it a mass effort. Um, through which you know there were hundreds of people that took part in this that built this um and and now we'll see this through to their first contract fight and onwards as hopefully this drive uh spreads elsewhere so the context in which this interesting pamphlet was written um it is is a pivotal moment in u.s labor history um after the end of the first world war the Steel workers saw declining fortunes. Uh, you know, like a lot of workers after the war, uh, they took wage cuts. Uh, wages stagnated. Working conditions weren't getting any better. Uh, steel was an extremely important industry. It was integral to the daily functioning of industrial capitalism in the United States. Uh, and yet, uh, hundreds of thousands thousands of workers and their families uh, were put out by the steel trust, um, were paid pretty poorly. Um, and uh, one of the reasons for this was the failure of the established union, which covered iron and steel workers, 
to really effectively organize the industry. And this uh, only grew worse um, after the war when uh, the American Feder Federation of Labor began to decline in membership uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, and as a result of this, the lot of steelworkers only got worse. And in response, a, a strike was called uh, by uh, by the steelworkers uh, in one area, and it quickly spread across the country and came to uh, came to involve uh, 365,000 steelworkers and shut down a lot of the steel mills and, and uh, the old steel centers of, of Chicago and Gary, Indiana. Um, and all over the country. Um, one of the key leaders in this strike was the writer of this pamphlet, William Z. Foster, who at the time was uh, had been a socialist and was moving towards uh, the Communist Party. Um, he was an important labor leader in his own right and uh, had close ties with uh, the rank and file and the and the leadership of of unions. Um, so he was well positioned to. Uh, take a role in this strike. Um, the strike went out for months and ultimately ended in a total rout for the steel workers. And uh, this was basically the last rumbling of uh, organizing in the steel industry for another 15 years. But uh, Foster was not really discouraged by the defeat of the 1919 steel strike. And he continued doing work in the labor movement and uh, focused on other sectors throughout the 20s. But um, by the time the 30s rolled around and uh, there was a more friendly administration to labor in the White House and the, and the conditions were right for the organization of basic industry, um, Foster was uh, back again and he was uh, one of the key players in the formation of the Steelworker Organizing Committee, um, which was created uh, under the onus of the, uh, the the Congress of Industrial Organizations, the CIO, um, and very rapidly, uh, steel workers for the first time were organized on a mass scale. And uh, this this document, this pamphlet, uh, speaks to the methods with which that was done, um, and gives us an idea of of what the on the ground struggle was like uh, in this in this uh, sector that had been thought traditionally to be basically unorganizable. Um, you know, the, the steel trust since the time of Andrew Carnegie was extremely powerful in American politics and had shown that it was willing to, to go to any length to stop uh, workers organizing, uh, including massacres uh, and, and rolling out the National Guard and the police uh, in their defense. So this example is not 100% analogous, obviously, but I think there, is, there are some key similarities um, between what happened in steel and what happened uh, at Amazon and what is beginning to happen at Amazon. Um, for, for one, the strategic importance of both sectors in the context of the economies under which they're functioning uh, is, is uh, similar. Um, steel, as I mentioned, was uh, a key part of the industrial economy. Uh, you know, any uh, well, most of the stuff that was manufactured required steel. Uh, you know, construction requires steel. All of this, so steel workers were well positioned to uh, to uh, make an attack on on the on the capitalist. Um, likewise, uh, our service. Our primarily service economy today uh, is uh, functions largely off of um, logistics, UPS, FedEx, Amazon. Um, Amazon controls uh, a lot of shipping infrastructure. They control um, air, freight, uh, all of this stuff, and they deliver a lot of stuff, which is important. They bring in a lot of profits. They're the second largest private sector employer. Uh, in the nation. Um, so clearly they're of great importance. Uh, likewise, the established unions have failed insofar as they have even tried to organize Amazon thus far. Um, and for the most part, they haven't even tried. Uh, they've 
been focused more on on servicing existing membership um, of unions, uh, which is not not uh, been great for union membership, which has declined year after year. Um, and this has had broad implications, not just for Amazon workers who I think, as we know, uh, suffer under hyper exploitation, uh, but this has had broader implications for the working class uh, as a whole. Uh, declining real wages, um, worsening working conditions, the normalization of the sort of hyper exploitation that they face at Amazon. Um, these things are, are now realities because of Amazon's hegemonic presence and the until now lack of organization among Amazon workers. Uh, in, in a broader sense, uh, this has also had implications for the political fortunes of the working class. Uh, the lack of organization in some of the largest private sector employees uh, has meant that there, there's no representation uh, for workers uh, in the economic field, which by extension means that they don't have representatives in the political field. If there's no strong working class organization uh, in the workplace, uh, workers are not represented at the ballot box either. Uh, I think as we know, this has had disastrous implications over the past few decades. And so uh, clearly it's important that uh, we organize Amazon and now I'd like to get a little more into uh, what the pamphlet actually says. Um, Foster uh, says in this pamphlet that uh, worker organizers can't rely on blueprint methods. You know, there are no easy victories. There are no shortcuts to victory. There's no step-by-step -step plan for how you win. Uh, at the most basic level, you have to have total flexibility of tactics. You have to be willing to uh, experiment and uh, you should be uh, adapting to the environment as it changes, uh, as the terrain changes, which it frequently does. Um, capitalists are very good at this. Uh, they adapt uh, very quickly to changing conditions and to changing pressures in the economy. Um, and if workers hope to best them, on this terrain, they should get used to that as well. Um, the next thing is something that we touched on a little bit last week, uh, but I think is worth reiterating. Uh, Foster says that uh, the, the campaigns cannot be led by paid organizers, uh, by union staff, or by uh, bureaucrats um, of any apparatus. Uh, it has to rely on mass participation of the workers in the workplace themselves and must uh, rely on the principles of trade union democracy, um, which means exactly what it sounds like. Um, involving as many people as possible in the day-to-day uh, -day functioning of the campaign, uh, getting people to feel like they're a part of the movement for a union, um, and and relying on the initiative of uh, the workers themselves and trusting the workers um, to know what's right for them. Uh, Foster also underlines the importance of discipline and organizing um, of a, a structured system in which uh, organizers are uh, communicating with one another, are writing reports, um, are are doing things in a disciplined manner, um, are, are very serious about their work and are not just uh, slacking, basically. Um, I think one of the most important things that he emphasizes is the importance of intention in organizing uh, and recognizing that you, the organizers, are the ones who are moving things. You can't just rely on spontaneous uh, a spontaneous uprising uh, or a spontaneous feeling among the workers. You have to uh, foment that uh, sense of unionism and you have to get people to take action. Uh, more often than not, they won't do it on their own. Um, people need a push. Um, and that's what organizing is for. 
Uh, next, I would like to call a volunteer to read this choice quote. Uh, do I have Do I have any volunteers? I'll volunteer. Thank you, Ben. Go ahead. The main objectives of the educational work should be to liquidate fear and pessimistic moods among the workers, to convince them of the necessity for trade unionism to win their demands and the possibility for success in the present campaign, to rouse enthusiasm, confidence, and fighting spirit of the workers, to win public sentiment behind the campaign. William Z. Foster. Yes, thank you, Ben. I, th I think that says it all. I mean, it, the, what organizing is really about is raising people's expectations, whether it's political, uh, whether it's labor, any sort of organizing. Uh, for two socialist ends, you're trying to raise people's expectations for what is possible in their lives. You know, I think people are really beaten down. People are generally pessimistic for good reason, because they, they have seen no... Uh, alternative to the system that we're living under. Um, they've seen no alternative to uh, the daily grind and the indignity of life working at Amazon or Starbucks or any of these other big companies. Uh, and it's difficult, slow work to get people to recognize that there is an alternative and that alternative comes through banding together um, in a union. Uh, but it's obviously worthwhile because uh, it's our only chance uh, to change things at at any uh, at any level. Um, so, what happened at Staten Island? How exactly did they apply these methods um, laid out in the Foster pamphlet, which which they read? Uh, I think they got at this really well um, on the panel, uh, which uh, Jacobin Magazine and Ewok. Uh, put on the night before last, uh, which featured uh, Senator Bernie Sanders, uh, Chris Smalls of the ALU, and, and a few of the worker leaders. Um, you know, they talked about how uh, this was essentially an independent worker-led campaign. It was not reliant on staff. It was not reliant on the funds of existing unions. It was independent in outlook and in functioning. Uh, they operated on the on the basis of of democracy and mass participation uh, they got more and more people involved in the daily functioning and organizing of the union it started out with just a couple people and very quickly grew to be a mass effort um, they got individuals involved in the work of signing people up for the union signing their friends and the people that they worked around up. Uh, they held mass meetings outside of work. Um, they got a lot of uh, social events and, and barbecues and uh, all sorts of stuff of that nature. Uh, one of my favorite anecdotes um, from one of the interviews published in Jacobin, which I'll share after this, uh, was from a, an immigrant worker, uh, a, a worker uh, from Liberia in West Africa, who talked about uh, organizing uh, group chats uh, for different immigrant workers. You know, he organized a group chat for all of the African workers in the plant um, or in the uh, in the warehouse, and uh, and got and raised pro union sentiment um, through that sort of one on one uh, communication. And he got contacts through that. And uh, as Foster says in, in towards the end of the pamphlet. Uh, the, the the goal of the leaders, the leaders and organizers was to activate the greatest number of workers uh, to do in, the individual buttonhole work uh, that is uh, absolutely necessary for the victory. Um, and they won. And they not only won, but they did so in a way that is fairly novel uh, in the history of the last 30 years of labor. They did it outside of, of any of the established unions. They're fiercely independent. Um, and they took on a one of the greatest uh, and most powerful corporations in the world. And uh, they won just just through the property, through the uh, through the principles of uh, of 
cooperation, unity, and solidarity. Um, and it's it's extremely impressive. And uh, but I think it's a testament to uh, the effectiveness and the lasting efficacy of of the methods laid out in this pamphlet. Um, if you haven't already, I would recommend reading it. Um, I think I think for most of the people on this call, it'll probably be uh, fairly um, self-explanatory uh, and and fairly obvious almost. But it's good to see it laid out in this sort of systematic way. Um, and it's I think it's uh, obviously useful um, for people who are less primed um, to uh, to socialist organizing and to into the labor movement. Um, so that's that's my uh, short presentation. Uh, I, here are some further readings, including the pamphlet and uh, that that panel, and, and two two interviews in Jacobin, which I both thought were um, very useful uh, for getting at the getting at the heart of what it was that was successful about the campaign, and um, hopefully, this uh, all of this can serve as inspiration for. Uh, further organizing, because if they can win at Amazon, um, if they can win at Starbucks in the face of multi-million dollar uh, union busting campaigns, then what else is achievable in this moment? And I think that's a question that we will only get the answer to um, if we take the chance of organizing uh, and yeah, find out what happens. We basically have nothing to lose at this point. Let's do it. Let's let's rebuild the labor movement and let's build a powerful socialist movement alongside it. Thank you. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much, Jake. Um, so great. Uh, we've got a, a good crowd tonight. Um, looking forward to our discussion. Um,